So, as I said, this is thread support and Qt. I have to push the right button. Uh, can't use the space bar like I'm used to. There's these green and red buttons here on the side that I have to use because of the video camera. So, to, you'll see me hesitate every time I go to change this live. Anyway, a little bit about me. My name is Brad Hughes. Uh, I am a senior software developer for Trolltech ASA. Um, based in Oslo, Norway, the headquarters in Norway. Uh, for the people that, are, that have attended my previous presentations, you've heard all of these anecdotes before, but uh, I love to talk, as you know, so I'm going to do them again. As I said, I'm a senior software engineer. I've been with Trolltech now for six and a half years. I moved from uh, a little town in Texas called Amarillo, in case anybody's been there. Anybody been there? I seriously doubt it. Somebody's actually been to Amarillo. Wow. Did you eat at the Big Texan? Did you eat at the Big Texan? No, you didn't. Okay. You just drove through. Yeah, that's usually what happens. <laughs> that's usually what happens. Anyway, so six and a half years ago, I moved to Trolltech. Um, I, my background is open source programming. I was just uh, having a discussion with her about my little pet project before I came to Norway. Um, I wrote a window manager, an excellent window manager called Black Box. And uh, it's actually kind of flattering. At the cocktail party here a couple of evenings ago, was people looking over their shoulder and saying, you know, pointing their fingers and saying, Brad, that's him, that's the guy. You know, so it's very flattering that people still uh, recognize the, you know, my meager accomplishments there. It was just me that did most of the programming, uh, minus a few years during my move and such things. But, um, Black box is what got me my job at Trolltech. Um, um, I was hired and started maintaining a lot of the X11 parts of Qt uh, from, from day one. Uh, and it's actually quite funny because you all heard Matthias uh, earlier. Uh, he, they, he just moved to Berlin to open up the Berlin office, the development office there. The Friday before he goes down to Berlin to open the Berlin office, he comes into my office. And, Typical Matthias style. How do you view your role in the company? Right. I hate that. Right. Makes you feel that big. Well, um, he likes to do that type of thing. And uh, basically, it turned out what he really wanted to ask me was if I wouldn't mind taking over some more of the platform specific parts of Qt, not just the X11 parts. I worked quite a bit on the threading code. I've done some of the Mac OS and the Windows code, and they wanted to put me in charge of a team, the platform team. Uh, give me, uh, we've got about six guys now. We're, we're the guys that maintain all the, all the event delivery and the threading stuff and the signal and slot stuff. So that's how I got the, 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 the title leader of the Qt platform team. So next year I'm thinking about having shirts made. I say crew, Qt platform team. Kind of cool. But, uh, enough about me. As, love, as much as I'd love to talk about me, we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about threading, right? Threading and Qt. I'm going to be talking about a couple of things. Um, I'm going to cover uh, just an overview. What can you do in Qt, right? Talk about the classes that you'll use to implement, uh, to implement threads in your Qt program and also some of the concepts that you'll use in your threads to hopefully have a very nice design and a, a very a program that performs uh, reasonably well. So, a little bit of background. Um, Qt3. A lot of people are still using Qt3. Uh, Qt3 builds on top of the API that we introduced in Qt2.2. This was about six months after I started at Trolltech. Uh, Qt3 has the things you would expect from a threading API. You can start a thread. You have classes to synchronize uh, between threads, right? To protect your data. You can store data per thread data in a lock-free manner, some in a, a way that you can have uh, instead of having to use locks and and hashes and maps, you can have lock-free per thread data. Uh, because we are uh, dealing with objects, we have a way to post events from your thread to a particular object. That object will handle that event 
uh, when the event loop gets around to doing it. We don't have control over that, unfortunately. It'd be nice, but we don't. And uh, with Qt3, uh, we have a way to force deep copies. This is uh, to force a, a, a real copy of a particular class. Um, uh, if you were at the Qt in depth presentation yesterday, or if you go to the one uh, next door immediately after this presentation, I'll talk quite a bit about our shared classes. Um, we have a way to force deep copies of these, something that you need to do in a threaded program. This is what you can do with Q3. With Q4, we, kind of, we took that and, and kind of added to it. Uh, some of the things we added were per thread event loops. This means now, instead of having one event loop that runs in the main thread, you can now have an event loop that, that is run in any thread. That thread now uh, is responsible for delivering events to a particular set of objects, right? Post events uh, are sent to the, the thread, and it will then send it to the object. Each object now belongs to a thread. This is called thread affinity. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Signals and slots, our favorite concept. We have we added support for um, for threads to the signal and slot mechanism. I'm going to show you how to use that. I have a few code examples, and. Um, we started using thread safe reference counting. If we have enough time, I might pull up some of the slides from the Qt and Death presentation to kind of show you how we do that and, and why we do that. But um, first thing we're going to talk about, though, classes. Right. Qthread. Um, this is the first class you're going to come across whenever you want to start writing a thread to program. Qthread is an abstract class. You have to re-implement the run function in order to, uh, in order to get, to, to be able to create and start and run your thread. Uh, there are a couple of other functions that I've listed here, the useful ones. Start, have to have a way to start a thread. Wait, it's also a lot of, very useful to wait for a thread to finish. Terminate, everybody can see that, right? Yeah, don't use terminate. It's there because there are a few valid uses of terminate. Terminate is something you really don't want to use. Terminate means whatever I'm doing at some point, I can be stopped. Right? If I'm sorting a list, if I'm terminated, I can leave that list in an inconsistent state. Terminate is a very, very dangerous thing to use. Use it with care or yeah, don't use it. That's probably the better thing. And in Q3, we have a couple of nice convenience functions to see whether or not a thread is running or if it's finished, uh, finished execution. In Q4, we, it's basically the same API, but we've, again, we've added to it. Qthread is now a Q object in Q4. Same API, still an abstract class. You have to re-implement run, but we've added some convenience things like these three signals. We can give you notification when a thread has started when it's finished and when it's been terminated, which you shouldn't do. And as I mentioned, we have per thread event loops. We have some convenience functions to, like in queue application, we have exec, start running the event loop. And we have a slot that you can call quit to tell the event loop to stop running. Here's an example, right? It's an abstract class. You have to inherit from it. And in your run function, this is where you do your work. Right. Anything that you put into the run function, that is what is executed in the separate thread. Right. All of the other uh, code that you put into Qthread depends on where you call those functions from. If you call them from run, they will be executed in the new thread. If you call them from the GUI thread, they'll be executed by the GUI thread. So you have to be careful about that. So creating a thread, very simple. Instantiate your subclass. Maybe you want to know when the thread's finished, connect to the signal, and you call start. Very straightforward. And the idea is that the, with these new signals, you get nice notification. Now my thread is finished. You can do whatever you need to do. Delete your thread, clean up after it. Things work, right? So we know how to start a thread. Uh, one of the things we need to do 
normally is we need to share data between the GUI thread and a secondary thread or between many threads a lot of times. In order to do this, we need to use a mutual exclusion primitive. Uh, we call, we have a class called QMutex. This is mutual exclusion. This is a class that you use to allow only one thread at a time to access a particular piece of data or a particular piece of code. I would recommend locking data, don't lock code. You, you'll, you'll find that it's much more efficient and much easier to understand. Qmutex is very simple, it has three functions. Lock, try lock, meaning try it and tell me whether or not you got the lock or not. Lock will wait until it can get the lock. If someone else has it, it will wait until they call unlock to release lock. Qmutex does report recursive and non-recursive locking. Uh, you pick that at when you construct the mutex. Recursive locking means you can lock the mutex many times from the same thread. A non-recursive mutex means you can't. Right? Uh, in a non-recursive mode, if you try to lock it recursively, Qmutex will actually give you a warning and tell you that you, your thread is now deadlocked because you locked uh, too many times. So. Example of how to use it, right? Like I said, you want to protect data. Don't don't lock code. Protect data. So uh, I've not done that here. I've locked code. I'll show you a little later on how to lock data. So first thing I do in my function is I lock a mutex. I've got a, a queue, a cache that I want to pull something out of. If I can, if not, I'll create a new something to put into my queue and then. I append it to my queue. When I'm done, I unlock the mutex, right? Mutual exclusion. Only one thread at a time can actually execute that code. One of the things that we provide as a convenience on top of QMutex is something called QMutex Locker. This uses um, something called RAII, Resource Acquisition is Initialization. That's what that stands for. What this means is QMutex Locker will automatically lock and unlock the mutex for you when the thing, when uh, QMutex Locker is constructed and destructed. Right? You can use QMutex Locker, simply put it into a scope or put it into a function. It will lock it when it's created and it will unlock it automatically when you return from the function. This is very handy if you have multiple return points in your code or if you throw exceptions from your code instead of having to constantly catch exceptions or call unlock ev before every return statement, you can use QMutex Locker in one place. Unlock will be handled automatically. The code will be generated by the C++ compiler to unlock the mutex for you. One of the things that we have done for QMutex Locker is that added a couple of convenience functions. If you need to unlock the mutex, you can unlock it and relock it if you need to. Starting with Q4, we actually keep state inside of the mutex locker. Previously, um, if you unlocked the mutex and then returned, it would unlock it again. Not always a good thing, so we started keeping state. If you call unlock, that mutex locker will not unlock again when it's destructed. So, starting with 4.2. So, uh, if you're using 4.2, you can, you can use this. Right, so my example from before, right, I can in this case, I don't use the, 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 the multiple exit points or throw exceptions or anything. So this just saves me one line of code. Yeah, but it, it looks kind of nice, right? I create my mutex locker and I do the same thing. I simply return. Mutex is unlocked for me automatically. If I have a complex function, right? I've got multiple, got multiple return points. I throw an exception in a couple of places. The mutex locker will be unlocked for me automatically when the compiler unwinds the stack. The next class, QWait condition. This is our condition, var uh, condition variable in Qt. This is uh, a class that you will use to atomically uh, go from a locked state to a sleep state. What this allows you to do is it allows uh, you to have a thread go to sleep and wait for notification that some piece of data is available or some event has happened that the thread now needs to now needs to act on. You can use QWait condition to do this. You have to pass it um, a non-recursive mutex because the wait function will unlock and if you have locked a recursive mutex 
12 times, the wait function doesn't know this. It will only unlock once. So you need to use it with non-recursive mutexes. It will give you a warning if you, if you give it a recursive mutex. Right. You call wait, give it your mutex. Optionally, you can give it a timeout. The default timeout value is u long max, which means wait forever. Uh, and of course, we have functions you can wake one, or you can wake all. Many, many threads. You can have two, three, four, any number of threads you want waiting on a particular condition. And you can have the choice of waking just one of them, or you can wake all of them up. Okay? As an example, let's say I have a multi threaded queue, and I want to dequeue something out of my queue. Use my mutex. If I, while, if I don't have anything to do, my queue is empty, I'll go to sleep. I wait for something to become available. When someone calls wake, this function will wake up. I'll go back to the while, check the queue. Something's available. Then I'll return again, pulling something off my queue. And again, here I'm using the mutex locker. When I call the return, my mutex will be unlocked for me automatically. Queue wait condition wait. Uh, Important to remember, it does go to sleep and release the mutex. So that means when you call wait, you release the lock. That means your data can change. However, when you're woken up, and uh, you're, you will have the mutex again. You, the mutex will be locked for you before wait returns. So um, this is symmetric. If you go, you call wait with the mutex locked. When wait returns, you still have the mutex locked. It's just during the wait that it's not locked. So whenever you return, you need to check your state again, as we've done here with the while loop. Right. And as an example, here's here's queue new. Now that we have a the queue function, we need to tell whoever is waiting that now there's something new in the queue. Right. Again, same code as what we saw before, but now I've added the wait condition to tell somebody now there's something available. Uh, queue mutex and queue wait condition, when you use these together, the, um, uh, I believe this is called the monitor pattern. You have a lock and a, a, a wait and notification mechanism. Some people prefer using the semaphore mechanism. Queue semaphore uh, in queue three is a simple counting semaphore. You use the, the increment and decrement operators, or this try function, to get access to the semaphore. And uh, you release it with uh, the decrement or the minus equal operators. It also has a, a way to tell you whether or not you have uh, uh, what, how many uh, accesses you can get into the semaphore and how many of them are available. Right. The constructor in Q3 specifies how concurrent the semaphore can be. Right? If you construct this queue semaphore with an argument of five, this means that most five threads can get into the, can get access to the semaphore. Any others that try to use the 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 plus equals or the try access, they won't be able to get it. They'll block or simply return false saying there's no more access. Once you release it, then more become available. The total is we return what you passed in the constructor. Available is how many you can get at this point in time. Q semaphore and Q4, um, we changed the API a little bit. Uh, using plus plus and minus minus, these types of things was a. It's a bit. It looks a bit strange. You you can't tell that what you're doing is actually accessing or or, or uh, acquiring or releasing a semaphore. So in Q4, it's still the same principle. It's a counting semaphore, but we've rewritten the API. The constructor now takes the number of initial resources that you can get from the semaphore, not the total number. Acquire and release are the only two functions. We do have the try again still. The acquire and release tell you uh, there should be an int in the release. You can acquire many and release many, of course. Acquire and release will, acquire will try to grab as many as available. There's no upper limit, so you can release as many as you want. And then we have, of course, have a way of accessing the number of available resources. This is the number that you can get at any point in time. So um, I actually covered this example in my previous talk. This is from the, uh, the Qt42 producer-consumer example. 
This is an example of how to use the semaphores. In this particular example, we have a producer, which is producing bytes, putting bytes into an array. Um, and we have uh, a consumer, which is taking bytes out of this buffer, right? So I have two semaphores, one to represent the number of bytes that I've put in to my buffer and the number of bytes I've taken out of my buffer. So the producer tries to get free space and tells the consumer how much it's actually used. The consumer does exact, exactly the opposite. It takes the amount that has been produced and says, now this is the amount, number that is free. This is how you use semaphores. In Q4, we introduced something called QRead-Write lock. This is the shared exclusive lock pattern. What it does is it allows multiple readers to go into the, to grab the lock so that they can do some sort of non-mutating access, some, something that's not going to change the data. We use this, actually, in when we implement signals and slots. We use a read lock every time we emit a signal so that we can allow multiple threads to emit a signal. But whenever you change something, we use a write lock. Only one writer at a time can get a write lock. It blocks all other readers and all other writers, so there's only one thread at a time modifying a piece of data. Functions, it's a very simple API, just like with QMutex. You have functions to lock to read, functions to lock to write, and then the, the unlock function. If we take my Q example, right? Sometimes you want to modify the queue. You want to put stuff in or take stuff out. Sometimes you just want to look in the queue. Non-mutating access. This is a const function. Well, it should be a const function, but I don't have the space for it, do I? Here I use read, write, lock. Lock it for read. Go through my queue. Find what I'm looking for. I return true or false when I find it. Well, that's, that code doesn't look that nice, does it? Queue new. Again here, lock for write. Put something into the queue and unlock. Thankfully, we have the same kind of convenience that we have in QMutex. We have QReadLocker and QWriteLocker that also use RAII. Resource acquisition is the initialization. Unlock and relock are there again. And we also, starting with 4.2, keep state in these classes. You can use these when you have several return points or throw exceptions, these types of things. Again, it makes locking much simpler to do. And here, good example of it, right? Of course, this one, we, don't, we just save a line of code, right? It was the other one that shows the, the savings. QThread storage. This is our template uh, thread local storage class. This is a, uh, a way to have lock-free access, meaning you don't have to have a mutex, you don't have serialization, you don't have to go to sleep waiting to get to your data. You can get access to your data uh, without affecting any other threads in a type safe manner. You can store uh, a pointer into QThread storage. It will be deleted for you automatically when the thread exits and uh, a few functions to get to that data. As I mentioned, you can only store pointers because of some compiler limitations. Um, if we were to use partial template specialization, we could actually store both values and pointers in here. Nice bit of trivia, but we can't. MSVC 6.0 and 2.NET 2002 don't support partial template specialization. So if you use either of those, you know, if we were to drop those compilers, which we're not going to do anytime soon, we could store by value. But for the moment, you can only store pointers in QThread storage. So go back to my Q example again. Why have a global cache? Why can't I have a cache per thread? I can do this with QThread storage, right? Now, I can simply say, whenever I'm done with a particular piece of data, I can put it into a cache that is just for my thread, right? I can check, oh, if I don't have any data, if I haven't set my cache yet on my thread, I have to create it and put it in there, and I just simply use it this way. My queue function, right, this shows now I'm locking data, right? I'm not locking a piece of code, I'm locking data. My cache is completely, is completely uh, local to this thread, and my lock only affects the queue that, my, that this class represents. I'm not locking the whole function. I'm just locking the 
piece of data that I need to protect. I would really recommend doing this. You'll, you'll get better concurrency. You'll be able to have more threads executing at the same time by using an approach like this. Right. Important thing to realize. Local data, if you haven't set it previously, it will return zero. So that's why here I don't have to actually check has local data first. I can, I can do that based on the return value of local data. The has local data just looks nicer sometimes when you write it. Right? Those are the classes we have in Q3. Right? Take those classes, start writing some threads, start writing a few data structures and such things. You can use those to do some, you can use those to do quite a few things. We have a few other concepts that you can use on top of the thread classes, right? Post event is one of them. This is the thing I talked about earlier. You can post an event to an object, meaning at some point, this is like a notification mechanism, at some point something has happened, I need to tell somebody about this, so I post an event to the object. This will be handled by that object at some point in the future. We don't know when, but um, um, Send event it's much, uh, is another function we have in Q application. It's different from post event. Post event means do it later. Send event means send it right now. Send event is not thread safe, whereas post event is. Right? You will, post event is most likely the one you want to use. In a few cases, you might want to use send event, but post event is most likely the one you want to use. In Q3, all events that you post two objects are sent to the GUI thread. All events are handled by the main thread. Starting with Q4, now that we have per thread event loops, the events go to the thread that is handling events for that object. Right. This is the thread affinity again, right? We have, an, we have a function that's post an event to an object. You create the object on the heap using new and pass it to post event. Post event will handle deleting the event for you. You don't have to do that yourself. You just knew it and give it to us, and we'll delete it for you, right? As I mentioned, this is schedule the event for delivery later. It's not delivered when you return from post event. It's going to be done uh, by the event loop later on. Like I said, different from send event. Send event is something that you need to know. Send that event, I need to know whether or not this particular event was handled or accepted or something, right? That's what send event does two different concepts and so make sure you use the right one. This is probably the reason everybody is here, right? Signals and slots. I want to use signals and slots in my multi-threaded program. How many people are actually writing threaded programs now? Yeah, that's what I expected, right? Our customer survey shows that uh, over half of y'all are using uh, threads in your program. So this is most likely why you're here. Signals and slots, right? Communication between objects. In Qt3, we don't have support for threads in the signal slot mechanism. It works just like a normal function call. Any signal that you emit, emit, the slot will be called by the sender in the sender's thread. Right? In Qt4, slightly different. We've added something called the connection type. This connection type has three values, automatic, direct, and queued. Automatic is the default. Direct is the cute three behavior. This means when I emit, call the slot just like a normal function. Queued uses the post event mechanism to post an event to the object. That object will handle the event and call your slot for you. It's something we've implemented for you. Uh, automatic is the one that chooses which one is the right one at this point in time at, in my program. Checks three things. Checks what the current thread is checks what the sender's thread is, and it checks what the receiver's thread is, right? Every object belongs to a thread. If those two don't match, and the current thread doesn't match either of those, then you use the queued type. If all of them match, this means the current thread, the receiver, and the sender are all, they all belong to the same thread, so we can call it just like a normal function call. It's much more efficient to do it that way, right? So that's what automatic does for you. So how do you use this? Well, that's the nice thing. You use it just like you would in a GUI program. 
you create some object, connect your signal to whatever object you want to receive your slot. At connection time, like I said, default, uh, the default is automatic, but you can choose if you want a different type, whatever you call connect. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. Whenever you emit the signal, the slot will be called at some point later in time. I had a question earlier. Um, it's a bit hard to see with, uh, with uh, the lights here. I had a question earlier about signals and slots and threads. Um, using Q3, you, have, uh, you, you would use the post event mechanism. The question was, is then the, the question that I had earlier was whether or not I can use signals and slots without having a sender. Well, I lied to you. I'm sorry. You can do it without a sender. We added a, a function called invoke method to the QMeta object class. You can call a slot on an object without having a connection, without having a sender. You can do this and it will be called just like a normal function call. Or uh, you can pass arguments as well, just like you can to a normal function. And you can also do it queued. Or you can use automatic. It will check if the current thread is the same thread as the object you're sending to. Automatic means if they don't match, use post event. If they do match, call it like a normal function. So I'm sorry for lying to you. It makes me look bad. I should have read my notes first. That was signals and slots. The other mechanism I want to talk about, the concept that we have in Qt, uh, is something that will uh, that will affect people porting from Qt3 to Qt4. Uh, Qt has used uh, the implicit sharing mechanism for, for a long time, uh, longer than I've been at Trolltech. I've been at Trolltech for six and a half years, right? Implicit sharing, this is this is our the name that we use for copy on write, right? We have QString, QList, these types of classes, they share data. Uh, when you modify an instance, it will make a copy and just modify that individual copy instead of changing the value that many others uh, would normally, that, m that many other instances would see. So in Qt3, uh, this also applies to Qt2 and other versions, the normal, uh, the, the reference counting is done using normal integer operations, increment and decrement. This isn't thread safe. Uh, one of the things that we had in Qt3 was a class called QDeepCopy, uh, which would force a copy of your data that you could then pass off to another thread. This is a bit cumbersome, uh, uh, um, uh, but it's, uh, if you use Q3, this is something that you'll need to, to take care of. Make sure the data you're passing between threads is, is uh, detached and uh, not being shared between multiple instances of your, of your string or list or these uh, various classes. Small bit of trivia I put down here at the bottom. Uh, in Qt2 and in Qt3, we had something called explicit sharing. Um, this was a really weird concept. It was the normal sharing mechanism. You make a copy of a string or, uh, I'm sorry, of an image or, or a qubyte array. The, we would do the normal sharing mechanism. We just simply increment a reference count. But uh, if you modified the image or the byte array, it wouldn't detach. You had to explicitly detach if you wanted the, the modification not to affect all threads, or I'm sorry, all instances. We removed that in Q4. It, it, it was weird. I don't know why they did that. Like I said, this is stuff that they had done before I started the troll deck. So I'm not saying I, I, I have the right answer. I'm just saying this seems, it seems better to do it all the same way, right? So starting with Q4, all of our classes that do sharing are implicitly shared. All of them use the copy on write semantic. All the reference counting, right, we saw right, reference counting is not thread safe. What can happen is um, a thread that is working on an instance that happens to be shared between two threads can get a reference count that is going to increment. Well, it's got a value. It's going to add one to it. And then another thread comes in behind our back and does the same thing. The value we put back is wrong. If we use atomic reference counting, this doesn't happen. So 
By doing this, we eliminate the need for QDeep copy, which means our code now looks a lot cleaner. Values look like real value types. There's, you don't have to know about the sharing mechanism that goes on behind. This is something we did for, for you guys, so that this makes programming look easier for you. Of course, this only applies to the Qt4 classes. The Qt3 support classes still work the way they did, so that code that you're porting will behave the way it did in Qt3. So. Right, an example of how this implicit sharing will affect your life. Right. I have a string in my run function. I'm going to read something. I'm going to get, get some data from a file. Something. I'm going to assign something to this, to this string. Right. Now, this is where implicit sharing comes into action. I'm now sharing data with uh, this string is now sharing data with whatever data I read from the file. If I emit a signal and pass the string in the uh, in as an argument to a slot. That slot will now most likely have a copy as, of the same data that I've got a copy of. This is the implicit sharing in action, right? I've not modified anything here. I've just got copies, right? One of the things uh, that, that I want to point out, just to eliminate any confusion, the atomic reference counting, we talk about thread safety of the reference count only. This does not make Q string or Q list or any of the tool classes themselves inherently thread safe. This only protects the internal reference count. What I can't do for you is I can't decide which order threads need to call a particular function in. If you're appending characters to a string, if I was to make Q string thread safe, there's no way that I know what order you are intending to call functions in. This is something you need to use semaphores or Q-weight condition and Q-mutexes together to do. So the atomic reference counting only protects the internal data in these classes. It doesn't give you thread safety. So doing something like this, if I have two threads that are trying to modify the same string that happens to be shared between them, a global string or, or some sort of reference back to a shared string, this doesn't work. You need to use a mutex to protect this. Right, you need to use a mutex to protect modifying the same instance of a Q string. Copies, you can make a copy, modify your copies, not a problem. But trying to modify the same instance from two mul from multiple threads doesn't work. Something to be aware of. Right. I have a feeling I blew through this. Yes, I did. How much time do I have? 